So we are on lesson number nine of the winter quarter, 2023. Title of the lesson is Nehemiah Cements His Reforms. We'll see how good his cement is. It, the scriptures are Nehemiah chapter 13. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the record of Nehemiah. And uh, we notice here that the sin nature is pretty resistant to reform. And so we pray that we would lean on your Holy Spirit as believers to help us walk in the way that you would have us to walk. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the first lesson or first section Section A is foreigners are excluded again. Notice that all of the section titles are ended with the word again. So that means that they did it once and then they had to do it again. So foreigners are excluded again. And that is verses 1 through 14. How about I'll start off with that one. Sound good? Okay. So chapter 13, verse 1. On that day they read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So when they heard the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. Now prior to this, Eliashib, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah, had prepared a large room for him, where formerly they put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of the grain, wine, and oil, prescribed for the Levites, the singers and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. But during all this time I was not in Jerusalem, for in the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king. After some time, however, I asked leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. It was very displeasing to me, so I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, so that the Levites so that the Levites and the singers who performed the servants had gone away each to his own field. So I reprimanded the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Then I gathered them together and restored them to their posts. All Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. In charge of the storehouses I appointed Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Pedaiah of the Levites. And in addition to them was Hanan the son of Zachar, the son of Mattaniah, for they were considered reliable and it was their task to dis distribute to their kinsmen. Remember me for this, O my God, and do not blot out my loyal deeds which I have performed for the house of my God and its services. So I think the key thing to notice here is that Nehemiah had been gone from Jerusalem. Remember, he came in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, he stayed for 12 years. He was the king's cupbearer, and the king let him go for 12 years, which is a long time. And uh, then he returned to the, probably the capital of Persia. And uh, the uh, commentary I was reading, you know, it's not written down in the Bible. They estimated that he was gone about two years, maybe. <laughs> And when he returned, he found that things had degenerated in Jerusalem. And basically, that's what this whole lesson is about. As long as Nehemiah was there, they had restored the Mosaic Covenant. 
and they were following the Mosaic Covenant. When he left, it fell apart. Yeah, a cupbearer. The cupbearer gave the king his, he tasted the wine for the king, made sure that he wasn't going to be poisoned, and he was a close, very close advisor to the king. So he had access to the king himself. Yeah, no, it was in the law of Moses. And so it was from God that the Moabites were to be excluded from the assembly to the 10th generation. Oh, okay. So um, there was a Moabite that was an exception to that because Ruth, because she converted to Mosaic Judaism and she was actually married and put in the line of the Messiah. So she was an exception. So, great. so verse 1, on that day they read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. So now this is a different day from 1244. 1244 it said, on that day men were appointed over the chambers, the stores into them. So this is when they had established everything on that day. And here on another day, they read aloud from the book of Moses, and we know it's a different day from verse 6, where it says, During all this time I was not in Jerusalem. So this is when Nehemiah had returned after his departure to Jerusalem. So notice that reading God's word tends to induce a change of behavior in believers, doesn't it? They read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and all the reforms that went on were after they had read from the book of the law. Publicly, Ezra had got up and read, and they heard things that God said, and they said, oh, well, maybe we should do that, <laughs> you know? So reading the Bible is very important for the believer because it aligns you with God's will. But you have to have a heart prepared to listen, or it won't make any difference, right? And that brings up the verse we're memorizing now, Matthew 4.4, 4, where Jesus answered, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what Jesus told the devil when the devil was telling him something that went against the word of God. So um, the Bible is very important for the believer. We need to be in it all the time because we're in a culture that is constantly forcing us away from it, constantly forcing us away from it. And so we got to be in the Bible. Yeah, yeah the, the Bible is spiritual food. You know, we need food, 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 for our bodies. But if we don't have the Bible, our spirit dies. You know, it's, it withers. So this is Deuteronomy 23, 3 through 6. This is what they were had read. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord, none of their descendants even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. Why? Because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loves you. So that is what they read in verses 1 and 2 of Nehemiah 13. So these are other people that were ex excluded from temple worship. No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No one of illegitimate birth shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, 
shall enter the assembly of the Lord. So people born out of wedlock could not go to the temple. People who had been, you know, turned into eunuchs could not go into the temple. In the same chapter, verse 7, Deuteronomy 23, You shall not detest an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not detest an Egyptian, because you were an alien in his land. The sons of the third generation who were born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. So that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, so there were restrictions on temple worship in Mosaic Judaism. And if you're an Am Ammonite or a Moabite, you're not allowed. If you're a eunuch, you're not allowed. Um, if you're an illegitimate per a person born out of wedlock, you're not allowed. You're not allowed to come and worship in the temple. And so what they did then was they excluded all of the foreigners. Now, is that what the law said? When they heard the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. Is that what the law said? That is not what the law said. No, that is not what the law said. I think this is so important because we tend to do stuff like this constantly. We put words in God's mouth. So there's something about this in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. So they, they read that the Ammonites and the Moabites were not to be allowed, but then they excluded all the foreigners, which is not what he said. So um, we want to be careful about that ourselves. Um, yeah, I guess in a sense. You know, all of us are hip hypocrites to one degree or, or another because we proclaim Jesus, who is perfect. We proclaim to follow him, but we don't do it perfectly because we cannot do that. <laughs> so all of us are hypocrites to one degree or all another. Like yeah. You know, all we can do is listen and respond to the Holy Spirit. And he will make us less hypocritical as time goes on. But we can't not erase the hypocrisy until we're resurrected. Then we will be not hypocritical at all. Our, our words and our actions will be fully, fully aligned at that time. It will be a great time. So, but we can get better. So now what about the Canaanites? Those are foreigners. Were they to be allowed into temple worship? What did the God say about the Canaanites to do? He said to kill them. He said to kill them all. Man, woman, children, and all their animals. That would preclude them from temple worship. Yes. When they were to enter the land, the Lord's specific direction was, do not make a covenant with them. Do not intermarry with them, but destroy all of their idols and kill all of them, everyone. That was his instruction. Because Israel was the weapon of judgment that the Lord brought against the Canaanites. He gave them 400 years to repent from the time that he told Abraham that his descendants would go into Egypt and would be there for 400 years, and when they came back, he would give them the land. And the reason he said he would give them the land was that at that time, the sin of the Amorites would be complete. It would be full. It would be filled up to the point where judgment was required. And the judgment would be slaughter by Israel. Now, did they do that? No, they did not do that. And that, and that caused them to fall into idolatry over time because the Canaanites influenced them. And eventually they were taken away to Babylon because of the idolatry that rubbed off on them from the Canaanites. Sometimes what the Lord tells us to do, we, it doesn't go with our sensibilities. 
You know, you think, oh, that's so mean. You know, that's so mean. And that's what the world says about the conquest. The world says, oh, your God is so evil and mean. You know, look what he did to the Canaanites. Well, he gave them grace for 400 years. He gave them the opportunity to repent and turn to him. And they knew about him. You know, Rahab, when they came in for the conquest, said they knew. She was a Canaanite. We knew. We know about your God. We know what he did at the Red Sea. We know what he did in the plagues. We know. But they didn't repent. And so that's why they were destroyed. And that's why the Lord told the Israelites to kill them all. So verse 4, now prior to this, Eliashib the priest, this was the high priest at that time, he was related to Tobiah. Do you remember Tobiah? In some of our earlier lessons, yeah. Tobiah the Ammonite. He was Tobiah the Ammonite. So the high priest was related to him by marriage, and he had prepared a large room for him where formerly they had put the grain offerings, frankincense, utensils, the tithes of the grain, wine, prescribed for the Levites. So the room that was used to store the, the tithes and things that was to support the Levites, that was empty now, and it was made into a place for an enemy of the Jews to stay in the temple. And it, this was done by the high priest. And this was all done while Nehemiah was gone. Okay, so he couldn't watch over this. So um, this is what Nehemiah said earlier when they were trying to um, build the walls of Jerusalem. Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was near, was he, he was near Sanballat. And he said, even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. So he was mocking them and trying to uh, prevent them from building the wall. So now he's living in the temple. And then verse 6, he learned that Nehemiah was, had gone back to Persia. And after that, I guess the king didn't need him that much because he let him, <laughs> let him go again. It says, And I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God, the very place where Ammonites were not allowed to come. He was living there. So, and this is, all this is happening after, you remember a couple of lessons ago, the Jews had gathered, they were fasting, they had dirt on themselves, and they were confessed all their sins. And then now because of, this is uh, Nehemiah 9.38, now because of all this, we are making an agreement in writing, and on the sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites and our priests. So they confessed their sins for a day. They wrote up a document. They all signed it that they promised to obey the Mosaic law. This is a couple of years later. And Nehemiah comes back, and this that's what this whole lesson is about. They promised to do it in multiple areas. They were not obeying the Mosaic law. They were not. So verses 8 and 9, it was very displeasing to me. <laughs> that's probably an understatement. So I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. So Nehemiah, the governor, went in there and personally threw out all his furniture out of the room. That reminds you of Jesus cleansing the temple, doesn't it? Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. So he put back what it was supposed to be used for. Now, did this make him popular with Tobiah? No, and probably with Eliashib, who was related to Tobiah, didn't make him popular with them. So in verse 10, it talks about, I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, so that the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away, each to his own field. So, you know, the Levites were to live off of the 
the tithes. That was their income. People were not tithing. The, the people were not tithing. So the Levites didn't have anything to live on. So they went out, thank you, they went out to uh, the fields. You know, they had some cities assigned to them. And, uh, you know, so they took to farming and they were not doing their temple service because of the faithlessness of the, of the Israelites. So I reprimanded the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? Then I gathered them together and restored them to their posts. So Nehemiah rebuked the leaders and he went out there and regathered the Levites and said, you know, we'll restart your the tithing. So this is what we deal with constantly, is we all retain a sin nature. And the sin nature is in opposition to anything that has to do with God, especially worship. Especially if worship is going to cost you something, you know. And so this is what we constantly fight against. Everybody, every person at all times, <laughs> we constantly fight against this. So, um, so, well, when he did this, the people responded. You know, if you have good leaders, the people will respond. Twelve, all Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses, you know, right away. When they had a good, they said, "Oh yeah, yeah, we should probably be doing that," <laughs> and they and they did. You know, good leaders influence their people and make their people also good and make them uh, do what the Lord would like them to do. Godly leadership produces produces results. So, verse thirteen, in charge of the storehouses, I planted Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Pedaiah. So you see, he has one priest, one scribe, and a Levite. In addition to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, who was a layman, the son of Mattaniah, for they were considered reliable. So that's why he picked them. And it was their task to distribute to their kinsmen the Levites. Um, distribute to the Levites the tithes. So, and that's that's like what happened with the deacons in the early church. You know, the the uh, the widows, the Hellenistic widows, were complaining that they were being kind of ignored in the distribution of food, and so they appointed six deacons that were reliable and had the Holy Spirit, and. Um, that's what he did here. So then uh, Nehemiah prays. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Remember me for this, O my God, and do not blot out my loyal deeds which I have performed for the house of my God and its service. So Nehemiah is asking for the Lord to remember his eternal rewards because this is based on works, what he's doing. So he was a man of prayer. And uh, that probably helped keep him following the Lord, too. So anything else on that section? Nehemiah was probably pretty disappointed when he came back and found this situation. So section B, we're going to learn about a second disappointment to Nehemiah. The Sabbath is kept again. And that's verses 15 through 22. Somebody want to read that section? Okay, thank you. So, um, verse 15 then. In those days I saw in Jerusalem some were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading them on donkeys as well as wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, and they brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I admonished them on the day they sold food. What is the motive? for them to break the Sabbath here. Why they, they're breaking the Sabbath. 
the Sabbath is a day of rest. What, what is the motive for doing that? Money. The motive for doing that is money. They want money. So to in, to obey the Sabbath requires faith, yep. right? Because you stop making money for a day. <laughs> okay? You stop making money for a day and you're supposed to rest. And uh, so it takes faith to obey the Sabbath. And if we remember their time of confession... They said that they would obey the Mosaic Law, and then they picked out specifically the Sabbath observance. This is chapter 10, verse 31. As for the peoples of the land who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day, and we will forego the crops the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. So they promised that they were going to obey that both the Sabbath and the, sa the seventh year Sabbath of the land. So are you a promise keeper? There was a movement of men, I think it's faded away now, called the promise keepers. And they, you know, had men gather in the stadiums and gave talks and asked men to promise things. Men are not very good promise keepers. <laughs> and that is evidenced right here. They promised to, to do this. And then he goes back two years later, and they're not doing it. So they're, they broke their promise. Um, there's only one promise keeper, and that is Jesus. He will never, ever break a, a promise. That's why your salvation is secure. Amen. Because he promised you. He made a promise. If you believe on him, you will have everlasting life. You know, if he's like all the rest of us, that would be iffy. But it's not iffy because he's not like the rest of us. If he says something, it will happen. So that is good for us. And we want to be promise keepers, uh, but, you know, we're not as good as he is. So verse 16, also the men of Tyre, so the Gentiles were living there. They imported fish, all kinds of merchandise, and sold them to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath, even in Jerusalem. So if they could get some money on the Sabbath, they were perfectly happy with that. Yeah, so they were encouraged to break the Sabbath by, these are Phoenicians from Tyre. And it was for, you know, the Phoenicians wanted, they were not under the law. And they said, why can't you give us some money? Help us make money on this day, too. And the, the Jews couldn't tell them why, so they just did it. So then 17 and 18, then I reprimanded the nobles, so the leaders. He went to the leaders of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing you're doing by profaning the Sabbath day? And then he reminds them what happened before. Did not your fathers do the same? so that our God brought on us and on this city all this trouble. Yet you were adding to the wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. See, they have experience with breaking the Mosaic Law and what happens. They know what happens. So he called breaking the Sabbath an evil thing. Why is breaking the Sabbath an evil thing? It goes against God's will. Anything that goes against God's will is evil. That is the definition of evil, is going against God's will. Yeah, that's true. That you know, or, And that's kind of, um, that was not necessarily biblical, because, uh, you know, we are not under the Mosaic Law, but that came from the Mosaic Law, and the Christian Church ad adopted some of the Mosaic Law. And the Puritans did that, and we were founded by Puritans. And so this... Uh, you know, so the, on Sunday, so they moved the Sabbath to Sunday and said, you're not to, everything's going to be closed. Um, but that, again, is putting something in God's mouth which is not there. What God does say to us is, 
Hebrews 10, 23-25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. See, we need each other. You can't be a Christian by yourself. It's too hard. It is too hard. We need each other. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So our command is to meet. Do not stop meeting, as is the habit of some. We are to meet um, because we need each other. So disregard of that of this command to us is also evil for the same reason. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we help each other to uh, follow the Lord. Following the Lord is not easy. And we help each other to do it. We do need each other's encouragement. So verse 19, it came about that just as it grew dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the door should be shut. <laughs> so Nehemiah is going to enforce this. And they should not open to them until after the Sabbath. And he stationed some of his servants at the gates so that no Lord would enter on the Sabbath day. But they really wanted to do it. So once or twice the traders and merchants of every kind of merchandise spent the night outside Jerusalem. So they, you know, they wanted to do it anyway until he threatened them. And I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night in front of the wall? If you do so again, I will use force against you. From that day on, that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. You know, sometimes we need force to get our selves to do the right thing. And then he commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and that they should be the gatekeepers to sanctify the Sabbath day. So he had his own personal, they're probably from Persia, servants enforce it and then he had the Levites do that and then he prays again oh my God have compassion on me according to the greatness of your loving kindness so when we follow the Lord we should you know I think it's okay to ask him to bless you when we follow the Lord and say Lord this is hard will you bless me <laughs> I'm doing what you asked me <laughs> Okay, so that is, so now we've talked about the foreigners, we've talked about the Sabbath, and now section C, intermarriage is stopped again. Remember intermarriage? Okay, so you want to read 23 through 31? Thank you, Shirley. Yeah, so now you remember this happening before? About the intermarriage. Intermarriage, yeah. In those days I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Ashdod was the territory of the Philistines. So this is the same as 25, it was 25 years earlier when the some people came to Ezra and said, people have been unfaithful, they've been intermarrying with all the foreign lovely ladies in the area. So, um, and Nehemiah noticed, verse 24, as for their children have spoken the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. So they're speaking mama's language, but not daddy's language. <laughs> okay. This is to us, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. That is to us. So, verse 25 and 26. So I contended with them. This is funny. I contended with them and cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair. 
and made them swear by God, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take of their daughters for your sons or yourselves. And then he gives Solomon as an example. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the many nations there was no king like him, and he was loved by his God. God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. So remember Ezra's reaction to hearing about this. Ezra tore his robes. He cried, he prayed, and he pulled out his own beard. Nehemiah beats up these people and pulls out their hair. <laughs> so these are these are two very different men. <laughs> okay. Ezra was the priest. Nehemiah was the governor. Ezra prays and mourns. Nehemiah goes on the attack. Which which of these do you think was more spiritually mature? They're both pretty mature. Which one was more so? Yeah. Ezra, Ezra was more mature than Nehemiah was. Because he lost it he lost his temper here. He lost his temper, he went crazy and he started pulling their hair out, you know. And that is a fleshly response to this. The Lord did not tell him to do that. Yeah. So you know, Ezra prayed Fasted, prayed. He tore out his own hair, and there was, and there was something done about it. There was. A, I counted. I went as I was preparing this. I went back and I counted the number of divorces listed. There was 108 divorces in Ezra's day. That was 25 years earlier. To correct this, okay. Now, do we see any divorces here? There's no divorce here. Nehemiah just beat him up. He just beat up the husbands. You know, he, he found some husbands, he beat him up and pulled the hair out. <laughs> so now, there is no, they didn't deal with it in the same way. Okay, so they let it go. So that makes me think this, sin is very difficult to rid ourselves of. Sin is very sticky. Sin is like, you know, everybody ever read the, it's a kid's book, The Cat in the Hat, where it gets the pink stuff on the white stuff and you can't get it off and the whole book is, the the contamination is spreading to everything in The Cat in the Hat. It's like sin. That's what sin is. <laughs> sin is like that pink stuff in The Cat in the Hat. You know, you can't get rid of it. I mean, the only the only person that can get rid of it is Jesus. Jesus gets rid of it. Nothing else gets rid of it. So, um, so, and then you know he brought up Solomon. Solomon had a terrible problem with this, and most of it was probably politics. You know, making treaties with countries which you know Israel did not need to do. They had God. They didn't need any treaties with any other countries. But he did that, and that's how he got himself entangled with 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he went into terrible idolatry, and the kingdom was split because of Solomon. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was very wise, very wise, but not obedient in every case. You know, he started out great. When he started his kingdom, he was doing great. And then he went to pot because he deviated off of the law. He deviated off it and thought he, I guess he thought he was smart enough to figure it out without the law. So verse 28 and 29, even one of the sons of jo Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest. So that's where we learn that Eliashib was the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. So the high priest had married a foreign woman. And Nehemiah drove him away from Israel. He drove the high priest away. He excommunicated him from Israel, which is the appropriate thing to do. And then verse 30 and 31, Thus I purified them from everything foreign and appointed duties for the priests and the Levites, each in his task. And I arranged for the supply of wood 
which we learned about in the last lesson, and appointed times and for the first fruits. And then again, he prays, Remember me, O my God, for good. So there's three of these prayers through this chapter. You know, one for the dealing with the foreigners in the temple, one for the Sabbath, and one for the intermarriage. He did what the Lord wanted, except for the beating up and pulling out of the hair. <laughs> and then he asked the Lord to bless him for that, for doing what the Lord asked you to, to do. So, you know, if you're following the Lord, you can expect to be blessed. If you're obeying the Lord, you can expect to be blessed. And I think it's okay, as Nehemiah did, to ask for that blessing when you're following the Lord. Ask for the Lord to bless you. I think that's okay to do. And you should expect it. So next week, we'll look at Esther. Yes. And Esther will talk about the Jews that didn't take up the offer to go to Jerusalem. They would be like what we call nominal Christians today. So we'll see what happened with them. Okay. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you. We pray that you would help us to be faithful, as Nehemiah was faithful here, and that you would bless us because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So